inclusive, sustainable, and climate resilient uh, society. So three provocations also are, how can we prioritize, prioritize equ equitable access and benefits, addressing systemic racism and gender inequities, challenge discrimi discriminatory algorithms and practices in tech development, and integrate eco-conscious -consci approaches to mitigate climate impacts. The third block is about community-led initiatives powering inclusion, climate justice, and finding inequality. So this is about the vital role of community initiatives. And most of the initiatives that I have been working with are obviously local communities and also center and racial uh, and center in gender and racial raci racialized perspectives. So this means that community-led initiatives do play a vital role in fostering inclusion and combating inequality in the technological sector. So their localized approach, informed by firsthand knowledge of community needs, serve as a powerful catalyst for positive change in a rapid involving technological landscape. So also here comes climate action because what we see is that community-driven initiatives are central to inclusive tech development, local knowledge inform, target solutions for marginalized communities and ethical and equitable tech solutions are realized through community empowerment. Also, we need to talk about these disparities in the global South because we do face unique challenges in terms of these digital disparities, systemic racism and gender inequalities, specific towards uh, uh, in two years, we're gonna have a COP in Brazil. So there's a lot of conversations in this intersection. So again, uh, bringing these three provocations for uh, uh, this block, which is, so how the digital disparities, systemic races and gender inequalities inter intersect specifically in the global South. And obviously when you are talking about climate, climate action, again, community led initiatives, you need to bring this unique regional challenge and empower marginalized groups. And obviously how, when we amplify community driven solutions, they are essential for achieving tech equity and climate justice in the global South. The four blocks about just tech, equity, and the sustainable de development goals, because we know it's really crucial for the work we do. So how we interplay that, the integration of tech into our society profoundly change, shapes the trajectory of SDG goals, at the SDG. Technolo technology serves as both a catalyst and a challenge in our journey toward achieving, achieving these ambitious low global ob objectives. So it provides powerful tools for data-driven decision-making, innovation, and connectivity. And the three provocations for this are how technology can be a powerful enabler for achieving the SDGs through innovation and data-driven solutions. Ethical considerations are paramount to prevent tech-related challenges from undermining the progress on the SDGs and balancing technological advancements with ethical and ethical principles in key, is key to SDG success. And also advancing the SDGs is also related to gender and LGBTQIA2S plus inclusion, because we know that also there is this relationship between gender and how LGBTQ plus communities are disproportionately uh, impact. So in the pursuit of the SDGs, we have particular focus on SDG five, which is gender uh, equality and SG 13, in relation to climate action, recognizing this critical intersection with LGBTQI and plus community. So, because when we achieve gender and climate justice, it means involving gender and sexual minorities in policy and action. The three provocations are gender and climate justice involve considering genders, gender and sexual minorities in policy and action. And it it, this has been done with in, incredible pro projects in Brazil. Mm -hmm. LGBTQIA2S plus individuals face disproportionate impacts due to climate change, including homelessness and health issues. So in Brazil also, I'm very connected to projects that are supporting uh, the communities on how to uh, talk about this issue. Mm -hmm. And this is really uh, incredible as we are going towards a growing community 
uh, for the next COP, not just in Brazil, but the next COP um, in Dubai and then Australia and in Brazil. The last block is about a global framework towards ethical open practices. So one of the key issues here is how can we empower local communities through open data and practices? So how can we, for example, uh, foster uh, local community and small farms are essential for achieving multiple SDGs. So when I'm talking about small farming, small farming here, I'm talking about mostly agroecology and other movements that are quite common in Brazil and quite common led by women. Also open data and practices can empower community to make informed decisions and participate in technological advancements. And obviously empowering communities and small farms aligns with principles of justice, equity, and sustainability. As lots of you might know, Brazil has a very strong landless work movement and with a key representation of women, people of color, and LGBTQ plus minorities. Again, also decent work in a green, green job sector, it's going to require for us to look specifically to women, of course. So in this realm, uh, a couple comments and provocations are how we can address open innovation while promising requires robust oversight to ensure it effectively promotes decent green jobs with gender equity and economic growth, particularly in the global South. Transparency and community engagement, essential for empowering marginalized communities to access green job opportunity, must navigate data interoperability challenge and prioritize that privacy. And open innovation's impact on entrepreneurship, skills development, and gender equity should be criti critically assessed, considering potential hurdles related to data interoperability and the necessity of strong policy frameworks within the context of the energy transition. So a couple of and my last comments on projects and solutions from Brazil. The Amazonian network of geo-reference uh, social environmental information that it's called HISGI, that it's a reunion of maps. And in this project, HISGI, for example, what we have, it's decentralized and public in intelligence, and we have a strong participation of women. So this is a, a, how it's a picture of the, the, the HAS platform, which is a platform, and you can all look online. The SITCH, which is the Center for Territorial Intelligence. Again, this is completely related to climate action and the mitigation of the GEE emissions in Brazil because mostly of our emissions comes from cattle, livestock cattle, and the expansion of the commodity supply chain based on soy and meat. So in here, we do again have a uh, increasing uh, participation of women in STEM and especially on academia, which is the case of this project. So it's really crucial. And since I'm really close to this project, I know there is a lot of a present of scientific and women in science in this uh, particular lab. Again, and just a, very quickly here, the remote sensing and since climate action in Brazil has been leading up a lot into remote, remote sensing agriculture or remote sensing technologies and data practices to enhance agriculture. So these types of projects, they started to pay attention more on gender inclusivity uh, specifically. Another important point to not forget is that when we are talking about climate action gender, data is important. So in Brazil, for the first time, we had a census that was able to actually give visibility to the quilombolas, Afro-descendants that were enslaved in Brazil. And for the first time, they were part of the census. So this is a huge uh, victory for us in Brazil. And technology in defense of the territory are mostly the youth, the indigenous youth from a range of ethnies and, and groups in Brazil. And you can look more, but it's really crucial that we have tech and uh, media education really close to these groups. And most of these groups, you have woman, you have woman led initiatives and a very diverse uh, inside indigenous groups. 
Lastly, I'm on the map. It's a self-mapping territories and data recognition uh, project. Just really quickly, um, it's uh, actually an app. It's really incredible. We have uh, indigenous groups working to actually uh, promote uh, more out of these types of application and with inclusive of skills and the development of other necessities. Thank you very much. I hope it was enjoyable. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Laurie, to share many sites with us, show some tools and uh, mainly to show us uh, the Global South Lens, okay? Uh, if you want, please uh, send us your presentation because we can share with some colleagues here. Uh, so we'll move on right now for the Matt McCor, our next finalist. She is a senior research assistant at the United Nations University. Please, uh, Mercy, uh, can can share the presentation. She has some issues in she's in the camera, but she able to present and talk very well. So feel free. Mercy. Yes, please. Okay. Uh <laughs> I'm here. Uh, so uh, apologies for um, not being able to use my camera. I thought I had it uh, fixed today, uh, but obviously it's still not sorted. So I'm really sorry for this. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my slides. Yes, uh, you can do a, a Zoom, please. Okay. Uh, for entire screen. Hold on, please. Oh, no problem. Can you see now? Yes. Uh, full screen, yes? Yes, exactly. Okay. Works very well. So um, thank you all for having me here. Um, my name is Mercy, as my colleague Larissa mentioned. Uh, I'm a senior research assistant with the UNUEGOP. Uh, we're situated in Portugal. Uh, the UNUEGOP is one of the uh, operating and special units of the United Nations uh, University System. And the United Nations University System is uh, made up of a few uh, other institutes uh, working within the UN system. So we are um, actually a special operating unit here in the historic city of uh, Guimarães in Portugal. Um, we are a multidisciplinary uh, group of researchers, of experts, and we are basically uh, concerned with uh, digital governance, electronic governance, as it relates to uh, uh, digitalization. Uh, we work with um, institutions and governments to carry out um, uh, development, institutional development and training. Um, we do core research and advisory services. Um, as for me, uh, my area uh, is uh, basically equality and inclusion. So um, an equality and inclusion specialist. Uh, my three main focus are in the areas of gender studies, uh, electronic governance and social responsibility. Within uh, gender studies, I um, focused on uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, as well as gender equality and equity uh, policies. And um, within uh, electronic governance, I focus more on digital uh, government services, uh, digital inclusion, innovation, and I also uh, lecture, I give uh, classes both at uh, university and governmental levels uh, on change management. Um, for social responsibility, I look basically, um, I work basically around corporate social responsibility where I consider social inclusion, uh, community development, stakeholder engagement, uh, value chain management, third party relationship, as well as uh, integration. So I'll be showing us my uh, the timeline of my experience uh, beginning from um, uh, 2005, uh, where I started working um, on projects with the United Nations. 
uh, European Commission and um, other countries like uh, Canada under the International Development Research Center uh, fundings. And um, we, I basically concentrated on uh, community development projects, um, uh, especially focusing on women and girls, social inclusion. One of the projects that um, we uh, that really uh, stands out till now for me uh, was um, the project uh, tied to uh, HIV pre prevention for rural youths. Um, this was done under sexual and reproductive health and rights, where we focused on women and girls and how uh, they can um, help uh, themselves in preventing uh, um, HIV uh, and AIDS. And um, I further, I went further for um, more research and education, uh, conducting research basically on social responsibility, integration and inclusion. I also focused uh, around this time on community development, especially uh, around women and girls. And um, my research also focused on uh, the integration of um, contributions between government and, and oil companies, uh, where I um, look focused on uh, the extractives. Uh, so this was where I did my PhD around. Um, and then um, I also uh, concentrated on uh, inclusion um, from 2019, from 2019 to 2022, um, where uh, we conducted uh, research um, on the uh, digital inclusion with DFS, Digital Future Society, uh, looking at women and girls and their accessibility and usage of uh, digital services, digital government services, and how they can uh, reach and use these services. And under UNICEF, uh, also inclusion for children, digital services uh, for children as well. And uh, now I'm currently working on gender mainstreaming, digital inclusion, and um, I still teach change management. Um, I highlighted uh, CSRO and the likes uh, in red because I'll be giving uh, uh, an example of a project that I got involved in uh, recently this year. Uh, and I highlighted this because it relates um, majorly to climate change. So uh, how does these uh, experience intersect with uh, climate change? Um, or as for um, my experience, this may not directly highlight climate change action um, action experiences, but my background um, offers versatility that can be adapted to address climate change ch challenges. Um, for example, I'm not gonna be talking about all of this, sorry, I'm not gonna be talking about all of this, but for example, we, um, um, Research and data analysis uh, is very vital for climate research. Climate science relies heavily on data analysis and research. And uh, more so, it, um, it helps for modeling climate scenarios and conducting uh, research on climate-related topics. Um, let's look at corporate social responsibility, uh, for example, as well. Um, here, yeah, my experience uh, in corporate social uh, responsibility and sustainable development intersects uh, directly with uh, climate action in that it includes initiatives that are aimed at reducing uh, um, companies' um, environmental impact, which can actually contribute to mitigating climate change. So um, uh, this is very uh, important uh, to highlight here. Um, let's see uh, climate action and gender. Um, we, all, we already know that climate change is one of the most pressing global issues of our time, and it's increasingly very urgent uh, for us to tackle. Uh, it is undeniably one of the most critical uh, global challenges that we face. 
So importantly, these uh, the impact uh, uh, very the impact from climate change. Um, they're very multifaceted and far-reaching, and these impacts are not gender neutral. They they are disproportionately um, affecting women and girls um, all over the world. They are increasing uh, gender inequalities in various ways. So uh, I'm going to be speaking about my experience uh, and my expertise around uh, these inequalities by citing uh, one of the projects that I got involved in recently. Let us look at, uh, before I delve into that project, um, I just want us to see uh, climate action and gender uh, at a glance. Um, so here again, like I mentioned, uh, climate change is uh, actually uh, making our world more fragile and unequal. Um, women are particularly exposed to risk and disasters women are 14 times more likely than men to, to die from these uh, disasters. In, in many cities, uh, we find that women are often responsible for tax. Um, if you look at the fire rights pictures, women are uh, taxed with collecting water, firewood, farming, caregiving. And these are highly uh, uh, dependent on natural resources, as we all know. Uh, climate change, including uh, water scarcity and erratic weather patterns can uh, increase the burden of women and girls um, in carrying out these roles and tasks. So in meeting the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, there has to be a gender responsive approach that ensures that no woman is uh, left behind. Uh, that being said, uh, let's jump into uh, the project that I got, got involved in recently on uh, uh, the extractives. So uh, following Nigeria's commitment to the net zero emissions by 2060, um, okay, so Nigeria's threshold is, uh, is 20, 2060, actually meeting uh, this net zero emission. Um, th this study tried to investigate and review the alternatives uh, that are placed before communities and non-state actors whose livelihood uh, depend on fossil fuels and local refining. So uh, the project was implemented by Spaces for Change. Uh, these three uh, uh, um, NGOs um, on the left side of the slide, uh, Spaces for Change, Extractive 360, which I am uh, uh, affiliated with, with uh, which I am associated with, and Youth and Environmental Advocacy uh, Center. Uh, the research was supported by uh, Ford Foundation's Extractive Industry and Climate Change uh, Governance Fund. And it was managed by uh, African Center for Energy Policy um, um, NGO. So um, my role actually was to spearhead a one day community uh, workshop for one of the states where the, the project was conducted. It was actually carried out in the Niger Delta region and it was con um, conducted in three uh, states uh, out of the nine uh, Niger Delta uh, states. So the Niger Delta is made up of nine uh, states and uh, three were picked out uh, of these states to carry out this research. Actually, the, the aim was to um, integrate the perspectives of uh, marginalized groups, especially women and artisanal refiners, uh, into the Nigeria's energy transition plan. So Nigeria has been working on various initiatives and plans you know, to, to, transi to transition its sector. Um, uh, but uh, it's been a little challenging 
So, um, and it's been challenging working um, with the, in, around the local government level because it seems like the energy transition uh, plan is sort of silent on these uh, uh, communities. And one of the key uh, documents for outlining, uh, for pushing for uh, this, uh, uh, issues around uh, uh, fossil fuel extraction is that the approach that uh, the transition, the, the energy uh, transition plan um, opens up spaces or opens up a space for, for communities to come together to be able to deliberate and uh, speak up on um, how they've been feeling about the extraction of, of oil in, in their communities, especially where oil and gas is extracted. Um, also, um, um, apart from local level deliberations, uh, such as these uh, community engagements, um, the, the agenda for the document was uh, to um, bring about the perspective of women, and their involvement, how they can come uh, together to also be able to make decisions on uh, ongoing deliberations about the, the plan. Um, so um, some of the objectives of the project uh, was one to document the opinions of these women and artisanal refiners, refiners uh, community leaders uh, on, on how what what to understand or how to understand the energy transition, what it means to them, and also to provide uh, these group of people the necessary tools to understand the just transition and to push for uh, redress for social and uh, or social economic injustice. Uh, that are associated with fuel fuels around around fuel extraction around the, the the local communities, and um, to create new spaces for deliberation, new spaces to uh, integrate the needs and priorities of of this group of people. Uh, more so, um, the the project, uh, the project was, like I said, conducted around the Niger Delta region. Interviews were collected from women, uh, women groups, traditional leaders, uh, traditional chiefs, elders, youths, uh, as well as agencies and uh, um, government agencies and oil companies uh, within the region. And these um, uh, were set, centered around communities where oil uh, is being uh, extracted. So uh, for the findings, uh, it was found that Nigeria is phasing out uh, fussy fuels uh, as part of its uh, climate commitments to meeting the uh, 2060 uh, commitments or promise uh, meeting this target will put an end to Nigeria's historic dependence on crude oil. Um, also, national energy transition plans are silent on communities, like I mentioned before, uh, especially communities that are really bearing the brunt of the fuel fuel extraction uh, for, for decades. This has been happening for uh, so many years now. The, uh, the national transition plan uh, and policy also do not have um, readily, um, a ready arrangement for cleanups or compensation uh, for these uh, communities. So the environmental degradation around these communities uh, is um, quite, uh, it's um, really it's very hard to to swallow sometimes it's and it's becoming more and more difficult to to address this these issues uh also um one of the findings another finding is that the energy transition proposal uh by uh, cooperatives or co uh, sorry corporations or um, companies now uh, they retain the traditional um 
the the traditional way of keeping silent on on the communities. Um, it was also found that uh, communities want uh, engagement. They want to be able to participate, especially the women. They really do want to participate. They want uh, um, spaces where they can actually air their minds, say what they want and how they feel about uh, the environmental degradation that is taking place within uh, their communities. Um, more so, community support for the energy transition uh, is conditioned on the presentation of a clear and predictable roadmap. Uh, that's to say that um, from the perspective of uh, the people around the communities, a just transition also means recognizing the, the gender differentiated impact on hydrocarbon and availability of uh, adequate uh, uh, incentives for, for these impacts. Um, uh, also to find, uh, to prevent uh, a repeat of the mistakes that has been going on, uh, th there's a uh, need to, to dismantle the governmental grip on natural resources. So what are some of the key recommendations that the study uh, uh, put out, uh, put in place to, to prioritize the involvement of communities in, uh, in these kinds of engagements, uh, to involve women as key stakeholders uh, in, in, in this process, uh, also to dismantle the centralized natural resource governance and management system uh, to address agitations for, for resource control. Uh, this is very merci. important. Sorry, Mary. Merci, Sladisa. Sorry to interrupt you, just because we need to move on for our next panelists. Very sorry to interrupt you, just because we need to share time with our colleagues. Okay? Okay. Okay? okay. If you want to finish with like three words, one phrase, and we share yes. your presentation with our colleagues. Thank you to understand. Yes, so uh, in conclusion, um, it, it is time to speak up. Uh, there's demand on alternative livelihood for these communities, uh, these refiners and uh, um, um, women, uh, also uh, to seek redress for the historical environmental injustices and to learn new skills. And um, of course, um, concrete climate uh, action is needed if, it, if the country must, or the region, the Niger Delta region must transition successfully to low emissions. Um, and, and so I actually brought out this uh, um, uh, picture to, to showcase uh, uh, some of the, the uh, the needs that uh, that has to be done, the recognition of gender differences, equitable participation, and gender equitable uh, access. So it, there's a huge call for uh, to support uh, gender uh, justice and end fossil fuels. I'll take questions later. Thank you for the time and sorry for taking uh, your time. Thank you, Mercy. Move on fast for Lindsay. Lindsay uh, is a director for data engagement for Open Contracted Partnership. Lindsay, feel free to start. I don't want to talk too much. It's better you use your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. See my slides? Everything is perfect. 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 So thank you so much, Lori and Mercy, uh, for your presentations. I really enjoyed them. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Lindsay. I work for the Open Contracting Partnership, and I'm going to be talking about how we can empower women-led businesses and improve climate outcomes uh, by using uh, the power of public procurement. All right, so for those of you who might be new to the topic, why do we focus on public contracting? 
Uh, well, because public procurement is uh, conservatively estimated to be about uh, $13 trillion per year globally. Uh, we have a picture of the moon there because if you were to stack $1 bills on top of each other, that's enough money to go all the way to the moon, all the way back down to earth again, and almost all the way back up to the moon. So it's an absolutely astronomical amount of money. And unfortunately, women-led businesses receive very, very few uh, public contracts, and that's true globally. And unfortunately, even in situations where women-led businesses are winning public contracts, uh, they often run into other challenges with uh, late payments. So women-led businesses tend to be small, and when they do have access to public procurement markets, they can face uh, unintended uh, challenges and consequences as well. So there's a lot of room for improvement uh, of public procurement markets as an engine of inclusive growth for women-led businesses. And we've actually dug a little bit deeper into understanding the barriers and the challenges that women-led businesses face in accessing public procurement markets. We've done some research in both Latin America and in East Africa. But I think uh, a lot of these can be, uh, will be pretty recognizable to you no matter where you live in the world. Um, so first of all, uh, there's a data challenge. It's difficult to identify uh, women-led businesses. There may be no clear definition of what is a women-led business, and there would be a lack of gender disaggregated data about uh, in company registers as well as in um, supplier uh, registration. So those companies that are bidding, those companies that are winning, we may just not know whether or not uh, they're women-led businesses or not. Um, there's also uh, negative perceptions uh, that exist because a lot of these challenges go hand in hand where there might be perceptions that public procurement is an old boys club. It's not open to me as a woman-led business. I have no in. Um, it's uh, not worth uh, my time and effort to, to try to figure it out. Um, there's also the challenge of lack of access to finance. Uh, you know, as mentioned, sometimes it takes government a really long time to pay their suppliers. And if you're a small women-led business who, when you go to the bank, you're asked where your husband is when you're trying to get a loan, uh, those challenges in the banking sector are going to affect your ability to carry a public contract. And also, relatedly, uh, women-led businesses have a tendency to be operating on a smaller scale as well. So sometimes the size of government contracts are not appropriate for smaller businesses, and there needs to be some work to tailor them. In addition, of course, there's gender biases and uh, and norms that can affect uh, that can af affect whether or not decision makers are going to be giving uh, contracts to women-led businesses. Um, there's also perceptions of corruption. Um, and then sometimes there's actual corruption as well. So we definitely are cognizant that if systems are not fair, we it maybe it's not the best idea to drive a bunch of small and vulnerable women-led businesses to those markets. Um, and then there's a lack of transparency about the procurement uh, process, a lack of knowledge transfer about the procurement process and complexity in the procurement process uh, that makes it uh, difficult for new market entrants you know, to, get, to get up to speed. This is also about climate action. So in addition to the challenges of gender, uh, public procurement is also uh, estimated to be responsible for 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, there's a lot of ways that the government is spending money on infrastructure, goods, works, and services, that uh, is not necessarily optimally organized for climate mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. And so with these $13 trillion, we have a real opportunity to buy greener. And by that, we mean buy things. Sometimes it means don't buy things at all. <laughs> and then if we are buying things, uh, to make sure that we're buying things uh, that are going to um, help us to mitigate our impact on the climate and environmental degradation, as well as to empower people with the best uh, resilience and adaptation. So what are we doing about it? Well, I'm just gonna say a few words about my organization, OCP, for those who don't know us. So we're working in more than 40 countries around the world on open data and open government strategies uh, to basically open up and transform public procurement to reach uh, better outcomes. Uh, we do this uh, primarily with three 
uh, main ways of working. First, we do implementation support. So we do technical assistance, capacity building for procurement reform projects. We do research and monitoring, evaluation, and learning to document what types of reforms are leading to impact. Uh, and then we also do advocacy work to support partners with key messages and evidence to advocate for change. Our approach uh, involves, you know, really thinking differently about these problems. So we kind of work with teams to set their reform goals and secure their buy-in. Then we really work on getting the data needed to understand and solve the problem because, you know, we like to say you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh, so having the data is a really important piece of the puzzle. Then you've got to get these, the you know, stakeholders working together to if basically work towards the change. And then you measure, adapt, and institutionalize the reforms. So because this is an open data charter working group meeting, I thought let's talk a bit more about data. Uh, so one of the challenges that we have, whether we're working towards climate action or we're working towards gender empowerment, is that we really don't have great uh, data sets about uh, public procurement. Information might still be on paper. There's some there might be some data, the data is not well structured, not well organized, so it can give us very uh, little insight. Uh, so we've been working and developed uh, much guidance <laughs> to help structure and organize uh, this data. Um, and I've included a link there to our best practices for developing open contracting data portals with examples. And these use the open contracting data standard. So we've developed something called the open contracting data standard. It's a data standard to structure information from all st stages from of a public procurement process from planning all the way through to implementation. Um, data is being published by more than 30 governments uh, around the world. And this information is incredibly powerful for unlocking uh, the value in climate action and uh, and gender, as well as other use cases related to anti-corruption and other topics. If you are interested in using uh, open contracting data, we have a new tool, the data registry, um, where you can access um, each publication from around the world. So um, I'm happy to share my slides after the fact for anybody who wants to go and follow up, but it's data.open-contracting.org. So, how can we use this data to work towards those goals? So we've also developed something called the Open and Sustainable Public Procurement Toolkit, which goes kind of step-by-step step about how governments can start to set policies towards um, more sustainable public procurement. And sustainable public procurement, we use an umbrella that covers uh, multiple aspects of sustainability, including uh, social inclusion of gender. So how do we have more socially inclusive uh, public procurement as well as more environmentally responsible public procurement. And as part of that, we've also uh, created a guide about how to calculate the sustainable public procurement indicators with OCDS data. So what are the environmental, social, and economic goals that we have? What are the indicators that we can use to track our progress towards achievement of these uh, environmental, social, and economic goals? And then how do we structure our data to be able to monitor our progress. And of course, uh, the there will also necess necessitate some policy change as well to get towards those indicators moving, right? Just, just having the data is not enough. You have to have the data, and then you also have to have a plan, and then you have to execute that plan. I'm going really fast because I have to stop up in three minutes to go to another meeting, but I have uh, also some guides on what how to learn more about the work on gender and how, uh, what types of reforms can be effective when it comes to gender reform in public procurement. And now I'm gonna to touch very briefly on some of the places that we're working and what's happening kind of in the real world. So I'll start in Colombia. So um, we had a project, we have a project in Colombia where we've been working uh, with partners towards gender responsive procurement. As part of that, uh, legal there are new legal instruments that provide that clear definition of what is a woman-led and a woman-owned business and uh, policies to promote the inclusion of criteria that will incentivize the participation of women-led businesses in public tenders. Um, we also supported the National Procurement Agency to, to introduce gender desegregation in, of, of procurement data. So now, um, when we started this project in 2020, only 4% of public contracts were tagged 
according to gender. There was only gender desegregation for 4%, um, and that went up to 37% in 2022, and we're hoping to get even higher uh, in the coming years. And then we've also worked with local governments to pilot uh, new approaches. Remember how I mentioned earlier, sometimes government contracts are big. They're, they're really too big for a small woman-led business uh, to participate. So in Palmyra, uh, we experimented with subcontracting approaches. You take a really big contract for school meals and then make a requirement of the prime contractor to, um, to procure the food from local women-led uh, farmers. We are also uh, trying to work on that access to credit issue. So one of the other benefits of having well-structured procurement data is that you can start to use it for a variety of purposes. And so right now we're working on a new initiative called Credere in Colombia uh, or in Bogota specifically uh, to work on offering um, small businesses who are obtaining public procurement awards to give to facilitate their access to credit by connecting them with financial institutions and flexible credit products um, that can help them to be able to deliver on their goals. And then when it comes to green procurement, we have a project in Lithuania where we're supporting the government to reach a target of 100% usage of uh, the EU directives green criteria uh, for public procurement. So uh, we supported them to uh, set a target, uh, to establish the criteria, um, and then to set up a dashboard to show, you know, which which ministries are using the criteria and a little bit of change management, a race to the top to incentivize that use. So um, by the end of last year, the green procurement was up to 60% by value and 33% of procedures. And we're hoping that they'll get to that 100% uh, this year or next year. And so that means the when they're buying something, they're using green criteria. Um, and then we also have a cool project in India where we're using a lot of different data, so non-procurement data on floods, flooding patterns, demographics, uh, as well as procurement data to make better procurement decisions around flood mitigation. So that's kind of going into that climate adaptation and resilience piece. Um, so you can also support with more climate resilient infrastructure uh, with open contracting. But with that, I have to go to my next meeting. I'm so sorry, but I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, by email. And it was lovely to speak with you guys today. Sorry, I have to rush away. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, I'm sorry because I could, I could not control well the time. So we have some questions at uh, our uh, chat. However, need to finish, we just have one hour. I'll be happy to share with you the presentation and any question that you have, just reach us uh, at our uh, Google Groups or email and anyone in our uh, team and see you on the next month. Thank you. Thank you.